This recorded webinar was part of a USDA SARE grant funded to Fort Valley State University in Fort Valley, Georgia to Dr. Tom Terrell and Dr. Nikki Whitley. My name is Dr. Nikki Whitley. I'm from Fort Valley State University in Fort Valley, Georgia. I'm the animal science specialist. And joining us tonight is Dr. Tom Terrell, also from Fort Valley State University, a research professor who's done a lot of research into Cerecia lespedeza and our speaker, Reed Edwards from Fox Pop Farm in Lawrence, South Carolina, who's going to be speaking about planting and growing Cerecia lespedeza. Reed? Thank you, Nikki. I've been growing Cerecia lespedeza since 2007. Planted it originally when we had a couple of very dry, very heavy drought years, and I was looking for something that was much more drought tolerant as a pasture and hay plant. So through the years, have had some some real challenges, but have been able to turn that into a very solid, high quality hay crop that has been very dependable and has been a very, very good crop for me. So tonight we're going to be talking about planting and growing and establishing a field of Cerecia lespedeza, both for hay field use and for pasture and grazing use. There is also on YouTube a recording that I did back earlier in the year on growing and harvesting Cerecia and how to turn it into hay. So this is sort of a prequel talk to that. This is looking at if you wanted to plant Cerecia lespedeza next spring, now's when you need to start thinking about it, start working on weed control and fertility so that you can get a really, really good high quality stand of Cerecia lespedeza. So what does Cerecia look like? This is one of my fields of Cerecia lespedeza. It is a legume. It's an upright legume with a trifoliate leaf, and it can make a very nice, thick, dense stand. It is very drought tolerant. It's very green. There is no greener hay in the bale than Cerecia lespedeza, and very, very palatable to livestock. Here's a close-up. There you can see a little bit of the structure, the stem, the trifoliate leaves. So that's what Cerecia looks like. Why would you want to plant Cerecia lespedeza? So as a feed, and particularly if you have small ruminants, it has activity against the barber pole worm. Homuncus contortus is a very problematic worm for those classes of livestock that have shown a lot of resistance to the chemical dewormers and Cerecia lespedeza is very effective on those. Also activity against coccidia, another big health problem in small ruminant livestock. It is a non-bloating legume. Alfalfa and some of the other high quality clovers can cause bloat, which also in some cases can kill animals, but can be a problem. Cerecia is a very high quality feed and it is also non-bloating. As a pasture plant, why would you want it in a, growing in a pasture? It grows well in marginal and poor soils. We have a lot of those in the southeast, over farmed cotton ground, ground that has not been fertilized well over the years. It is tolerant of low pH. Most other legumes and high quality forages are not tolerant of low pH. So Cerecia is pretty noteworthy in that case. It is very resistant to insects. If you've ever had army worms march through your farm in the late summer or treated a alfalfa field multiple times during a growing season or different insect pests, I've been growing Cerecia since 2007 and I have never used an insecticide on it. So very, very resistant to insects. It is very drought tolerant. It is the most drought tolerant forage crop that I have ever dealt with. Alfalfa is another crop that is very drought tolerant, handles drought well, but Cerecia is significantly tougher, significantly more drought tolerant than alfalfa. And then from the pasture standpoint, it is actively growing during the peak activity of Homuncus contortus and coccidia. Those outbreaks are more prevalent during the warm time of the year. So if you wanted it as a pasture, as a grazing plant, they're growing when you need the help for your animals. So just a few of the really good qualities why you might want to plant Cerecia lespedeza. 
So what we will go over in this particular emphasis on planting and then on growing in that stand after you have planted it. So qualities of Cerise Lespedeza, the benefits of it is very drought tolerant, pest resistant, grows well despite low pH, tolerates low to moderate fertility, and it's a legume, so it fixes its own nitrogen. You're not gonna have to be going to the fertilizer store buying a lot of nitrogen fertilizer. You won't need any. So some of the challenges in planting it and getting a field, it is slow to establish. Basically, you won't be cutting it the first year in most cases. It is a very, very small seed, 325,000 seeds to the pound. It's about half the size of alfalfa seed. Needs to be planted at a quarter inch or less. So very, very shallow, but it does need to be in the ground. The seed need to be inoculated. AU grazer seed, and I believe the other varieties as well, do not come pre-inoculated. They do not come coated the way that most alfalfa varieties, clover varieties do. There's a benefit there. You do get 100% seed for the money that you're spending, but you do need to add the rhizobial bacteria inoculant to that so that it will then grab the nitrogen out of the air on its own. It's a warm season plant that goes completely dormant in the winter. So that gives you some opportunities. It gives you some challenges. There's some erosion challenges, weed challenges. When it goes dormant, it lets cool season weeds come in. You can also treat those without the herbicides harming the Lespedeza at that point. It also gives you the opportunity to plant a cool season annual crop over the top of that during the winter. So if I want to plant and get a good quality stand of Cerise Lespedeza, where do I start? So the very first thing, and it's the first step of establishing any forage variety out there, get to a soil test so that you know what you're dealing with with your soil. You can save yourself a lot of money in fertilizer if you don't actually need to put a certain type out. Get rid of your competing plants ahead of time particularly in the case of grasses. There was one of the writing questions was about Bahia grass control. I've never actually dealt with Bahia grass. I have dealt with Bermuda grass and Bermuda grass while being a wonderful forage is a horrible weed in a Cerise Lespedeza hayfield. And I have not found an herbicide that will take care of it once you've planted the Cerise. So, Bermuda grass does kill best in the fall, September, October time period, when it will take the herbicide in, take it down to the roots. So you really want to start, you know, late summer, early fall, getting rid of the weeds, the other forages that might be in a field, so that you have a good clean slate to start with in the spring. I don't like leaving bare ground over a period of time, so I very much do like having a cover crop over that during the winter time. I typically like to have at least one grass, one legume, and a brassica in that. So something like oats, wheat, or rye, crimson clover, and daikon radish. And then that would build your diversity in the soil, build some organic matter, and give you a little residual nitrogen from the crimson clover when you then go to plant your cerise of the next spring. If you need to prepare the soil, if you need lime or fertilizer, that's a good time to do that, to add that in, particularly with lime to get the pH adjusted a little bit quicker by incorporating that. And if your field is rough, which seems like every field I've ever started dealing with will just about rattle your teeth out when you drive across it. So if you're gonna be driving across making hay for years and years and years, it's a good time to smooth that out so that you can drive a little bit faster. And then again, you will want to inoculate your seed with a cowpea peanut family rhizobia and use a sticker solution to stick that to the seed. So which variety? There was a question on different varieties. AU Grazer, most of the improved Cerise Lespedeza varieties were developed at Auburn and come out of their breeding program. AU Grazer is the most recent of those. The grazer name, it was developed to tolerate grazing, to stand up to the pulling, the trampling that happens when you graze livestock over it. Historically, Cerisia did not do that very well. So AU Grazer is also very fine stemmed, which 
gives it very good qualities as a hay crop. It's also where most of the research has been done for the coccidia, barber pole worm, and, and some of the other things that are going on research-wise right now as well. The other possibilities out there, Sorala and Interstate, they, don't, they weren't developed from the grazing side of things, so I would lean towards them more so for a hayfield than for a pasture, but they also do not have the bank of research showing the health benefits behind them. Do they or do they not do that? Don't know. Chances are they do, but there's just not the research behind there. So AU Grazer gets a pretty strong nod there. So for how you go into planting it, for either hay or grazing use, Cerisia lespidiza is a feeble seedling that is slow to establish, so you want to plant it as a pure stand. It needs every advantage you can possibly give it during establishment. For hay usage, as a hay field plant, Cerisia lespidiza dries much faster than any other hay crop I know about. And one of the rules for doing mixtures in the hay field, the two plants, two or more plants need to grow at the same rate and be ready to cut at the same time. And then they need to dry at the same rate and be ready to go into the bale at the same time. The second part of that is the problem with mixing Cerisia with anything else is it'll be dry and ready to be baled and the grass that you have in there with it is not. I would love to have a grass to mix in with it, but have not found one that's anywhere close to being compatible yet. For pasture use, I would still plant it as a pure stand for getting it established. And then I would add other desired species. Novel endophyte tall fescue and chicory in places that fescue in the fescue zone uh, where that would be applicable would be a really nice mixture. Dr. Carl Hovland, back before there was the novel fescue and the grazing Lespedeza did some work with that. And I think that's a mixture that needs to be kind of revisited. But again, what I would do is I would plant my Cerisa in the spring, add the fescue and the chicory in the fall. Another option for pasture use would be to put a winter annual mix out there. And then that would come in go through the winter, give you grazing, also keep weeds at bay and keep the ground covered. And then you could graze it off hard and go back into Cerisia production in the spring. So inoculating your seed, AU Grazer does not come coated with a rhizobial inoculant or any other kind of coating on it. Now, a lot of your alfalfa and clover seeds, small seeds like that are similar in size to Cerisia will have a 50% coating on them. So that's an advantage here that you got 50% more seed in the bag and it is a fairly pricey seed. So that's nice to have more seed there, but you do have to do the coating or the addition of the inoculant yourself. So peanut cowpea family of inoculant that usually comes in basically a quart size jar. It's usually a black peat based powder and it is a, has an active bacterial culture in it. So you want to keep that cool. Don't want to put it on the dash of the car. You want to get it inside the house, preferably in the refrigerator until you're ready to use that. Moisten the seed. I'll usually divide a bag of seed up between two or three mineral tubs and moisten that with a sticker solution. I use one cup of sugar to four cups of water. I boil the water beforehand in the kitchen and let it cool off. Use a little spray bottle and it takes about a cup of that mixture per 50 pound bag of seed. A couple things that the sugar in there does, it makes it a little bit sticky so that your inoculant will stick to the seed. It also breaks up the, uh, gives water a little more spreading power. Cerisi Lespedeza seed kind of has a waxy coating on it and if you just pour water into a little bit of Cerisia seed, the water will actually bead up kind of like on the hood of a waxed car. So you're not getting a lot of wetting action. Putting the sugar in there helps it to wet the seed a little bit better. So after you sprayed your sugar water on there, sprinkle the inoculant on, stir it around. Might want to wear gloves while doing that because you'll get the black peat mixture coating your hands and under your fingernails. Let that dry for a few minutes, then you're going to load that into your seeder. The recommended rate is about 25 pounds of seed to the acre. I kind of like a heavier 
rate, for me, it seems to give a much finer stemmed plant when they're crowded together. You want to plant that using either a cedar cultipacker, double cultipacker cedar like a brilliant or a no-till grain drill. With either one, so I know people who have failed with both of those pieces of equipment. I know people that have gotten good stands with both of those pieces of equipment. And I think the very important thing there is to watch your planting depth very carefully. Southern Forge is listed at 372,000 seeds per pound. That's about twice as many as what alfalfa is. So very, very tiny. And you want it in the ground, but at a quarter inch or less of depth. So that's kind of a challenge to get it in. That's that shallow, but not sitting on top. So if you are prepping your ground, if you are disking and plowing, you want to pack that to where if you walk across the field, you're a, a boot print is going to leave less than a quarter inch impression in the ground. So some folks would say that you want to be able to ba bounce a basketball off of it. So it needs to be fairly firmly packed to make sure that your seed does not get in the ground too far. You want to plant after the last thread of frost. So you don't want to get it frozen after you get it, you plant it and have the seed come up. Typically that's going to be April 1st to July the 1st. Those of you that are in Florida, South Georgia, you want to be on the earlier side of that. And you can push it back a little more, the folks who might be on up Virginia, Maryland, into the Appalachian Mountain side of things, because you want to be late enough that you're going to miss the, the late frost in those parts of the country. So I personally have planted anywhere from April the 1st to June the 15th. One of the threats with planting later is when does it get hot and dry in the summer? And does your plant have enough root mass there to survive the hot, dry part of the summer that we invariably get? You wanna calibrate your cedar so you know how much is coming out. If you don't know how to do that, do a YouTube search. There are a number of ways of doing that. But if, you, if you're planting oats or something like that and you run out of seed because the cedar's planting heavy, that's an inconvenience. You can run to the seed store and buy more. But usually with Cerise Lespedeza, you'll be special ordering the seed. You don't want to run out. I particularly liked the cross drilling technique. And what that is, is if I'm going to plant 40 pounds to the acre, which is typically what I do plant, I will set my drill on 20 pounds to the acre and I will plant it twice. And so I will plant once going north south. And then I will plant again running east-west. That gives you very, very tight row spacing if you're using a no-till drill. It gives you a lot of plants very close together. It also, if you are not running a GPS guidance system, gives you less chance of having skips in your field that will then be weed problems later on. Fertility at planting. And I'm going to go into right after this, I've got a few slides from Dr. Chris Teutsch, who is Forge Extension Specialist at the University of Kentucky. Some research that he did when he was at Virginia Tech previously on fertility. But Cerise Lespedeza is a plant that a lot of folks will say, don't fertilize it because then you're fertilizing the weeds. Well, there are things about Cerise Lespedeza that are different than any other forage plant out there. The type of condensed tannins that it has in it being one of the key ones. But it does, go, it does do better with nice fertile soil. Its calling card is that it will survive if there is very low fertility there, but it will not thrive, it will survive. So pH of five and a half to six and a half is a good place to be. It'll tolerate lower than that. So, you know, you can go ahead and go in and plant, but I would also plan on, if your pH is under that, having some lime added. The cerise will kind of grow as the, pH starts to move up. Fertilize according to your soil test recommendations. There actually are soil test recommendations for Cerise Lespedeza. Sometimes the county agents will be surprised to find that. Or, you know, as an alternative, those of you who are in poultry production areas, two tons to the acre of broiler litter is a good place to start as well. So on soil test numbers, my preference for nutrient levels, phosphorus at 75 to 100 pounds an acre, K, 200 pounds to the acre, that's potash, and calcium somewhere 2,000 or maybe a little more. Now, 
those numbers are maybe a little bit on the high side of things. There aren't really any recommendations on that. Typically, you think of for alfalfa, you'd want to be at 100 pounds for P, 300 for K, somewhere 2,000 to 3,000 on calcium. So I'm kind of getting on up there, heading towards alfalfa fertility numbers, but it definitely pays off in what you get and what you grow. So I wouldn't let it stop me if I wasn't there, but that's a nice target to go towards. And we'll see in these next slides some of the response that you do get from fertile soil with cerise. Lower nutrient levels will work fine, but going with these nutrient levels has significantly increased both the forage quality and the yield that I'm getting. So some slides from Chris Toits. What you see here is a picture of their test plots. In the middle was Cerecia lespedeza that did not have fertility applied to it, and on the side, the fertilized stands. Here, a graphic representation of the yield. So from 2012 to 2016, bars on the left were the unfertilized stands, bars on the right were the fertilized stands, and the same color would correspond to the same year. Summary of that research, their first year yield was 38 times higher when lime and fertilizer was applied at seed, 38 times. Over a five-year study, the plots limed and fertilized at seeding yielded seven and a half times more words there. So that pays for a lot of fertilizer. So the data indicates that Cerecia lespedeza will respond to improved soil fertility. More work needs to be done to refine the soil test data on that and the recommendations. So there's not really any recommendations coming off of that, but that it does definitely respond to the fertility. And so apply according to your soil test data prior to your establishment. So then once you have planted, then where do you go? So Cerecia is fairly slow to germinate. The literature states 28 days for germination. I've seen it out of the ground in seven days. I've heard of four or five days. So, you know, sometimes it does come out okay. One thing, that slower germination sometimes gives you a little bit of a buffer if you have dry weather right after you put the seed in the ground. So after you've got the seed in the ground, you want to pray for rain. Of course, not too much at one time to wash that away. So one of the challenges, and you want to do a really good job of weed control before you plant your Cerecia, there are very few herbicides that are labeled for Cerecia lespedeza. Most of the ones that are are on the broadleaf side of things. So that's why with something like Bermuda grass, Bahia grass, you want to take care of it beforehand. It is a minor crop, so it's often not included in the herbicide labels. The next line here, the Wormex link is to the Wormex information site. There's a number of articles there on Cerecia lespedeza. One of those is Dr. Jorge Machidi's uh, planting recommendations and his herbicide trials that he did in some of his research. Some of those are labeled. Some of those are some herbicides that it's not labeled for use of that, but it does give some hints on some things that, that will work there. You know, along that line, things that will work for alfalfa typically will work for Cerecia lespedeza. You want to follow label directions always for your application rate, your surfactant use. Some of those call for other things like nitrogen in the mix. And sometimes that's a very important addition as well. In planting, planting year and harvesting, midsummer after spraying for broadleaf weeds, that's usually the thing that comes in the quickest. And I think the next slide gets into the actual herbicides. Butyrac is one and post, I mean, Pursuit or Thunder is the other. Those are two. Broadleaf selective herbicides that you can use over the top of Cerecia that are labeled for it. A lot of times they may not completely kill the broadleaf weeds, things like pigweed. So I will mow it fairly high after spraying for the weeds. So you spray the weeds, give it a week or two, and then mow it 
up about 12 inches if you can. That does a couple of things. You have some delayed germination with Ceresia, some plants that come along much later, and it gives them a little bit of light to come in and to develop. And it branches out the plants that are taller and lets them really develop more leaf matter. Then you want to let the Ceresia grow for the entire season. You do have seeds that will be germinating all through the summer and let it go to seed in the fall. So Ceresia flowers once a year, usually that's somewhere in the September time frame. It will seed then or it will flower then and produce seed after that. It produces individual seeds at the base of every small stem leading to a trifoliate leaf. It does not have a pod like a lot of the legumes do, the, you know, a bean pod type of thing. It has individual seeds. That will then give you a seed bank for future years. I will very often, after the first hard frost, I will graze my cerise at that point because it is going to lose its leaves a couple of weeks after that. So you can let your livestock graze that and take the leaves off, scatter the seeds for you, and kind of get all that done at one time. Ceresia does go completely dormant in the winter, so there are opportunities there while it's dormant to do some weed control, or if you're thinking about grazing, or even if it's a hay field, to keep it covered with a winter annual cover crop. So it usually takes about 28 degrees, in my experience, for that to get knocked back dormant. You know, right at 32 doesn't seem to do it. It seems to be a little bit lower, about 28 degrees. Shortly thereafter, the leaves will fall off. The field will look completely bare until spring, and the first time that you're dealing with it, you will be very scared that you're never gonna see the stuff again because the field looks absolutely dead. Uh, you have the potential here to use a cool season cover crop, especially if you are planting in the Ceresia for pasture usage. So for the cool season, cover crop, I would do something that would include a small grain, so oats, wheat, cereal rye, a legume like crimson clover, and then a brassica. In a hay field, my, I've got a strong preference for daikon radish. Usually up here, those will winter kill. You may have to take care of them in the lower regions of the, of the growing zone. And actually, the last two years here, they haven't winter killed. So if it is a hay field, getting that cover crop off in time for your Ceresia to come out of the ground and not be smothered, and particularly if you are selling the hay to not have a lot of residual you know, oats and that sort of thing is, is kind of critical. So in my case, for my hay field, I've typically kept my winter cover crop fairly simple. I've been using black oats, crimson clover and daikon radish, and I'm able to graze that a couple times through the winter with my horses and hit it with an herbicide to kill it back and either mow, graze one more time to get rid of that and give it time to break down while the cerise is growing in and not have much of any residue in the hay. So fertility, you want to soil test yearly to keep up with where your nutrient levels are. Broiler litter makes a, an excellent fertilizer for Ceresia because it does give you NP and K and the nitrogen is in a time release sort of state. So it's kind of leaking out at a small rate all the time because the Ceresia does grab its own from the air. In a hay field, broiler litter typically does not give you enough potash for what you need. So you will typically need to add some of that. And that's where your soil test will come in and figuring out just how much that is. I like to add a foliar application of boron and molybdenum. Those are micronutrients that boost rhizobial action. That's four ounces of sodium molybdate per acre per year. And that's a hydrate molecule. So it's four ounces of that compound powder. And then one to two pounds of elemental boron per year. I typically put that on a half a pound of boron in the spring after it greens up and then after each cutting. Too much boron at any one time can burn plants. So a lot of times that's why I keep it to a half a pound or less each time I spray it. And if you can spray it on in the evening just before a rain shower, that's good as well. 
Gypsum is another thing, provides calcium to promote root growth. It's also a sulfur source that legumes like. It also, that also does not lower the pH of your soil and helps to tie up free aluminum, which is not a real big deal with Ceresia is with alfalfa and the clovers, but if it doesn't have to fight the aluminum, it will do better as well. And so there's my contact information. I'm located in Lawrence, South Carolina, here at Fox Pike Farm, my phone number and my email address there. If you have questions, you can put those in the chat box. Did you want to go ahead and start answering those? Yes. So, so one of those herbicide application for weed and bahia grass control, you know, certainly do a very good job of taking care of things in the fall ahead of planting. And so typically if it's Bermuda grass, that's very, very high rates of Roundup to take care of Bermuda grass. I would imagine that would take care of bahia as well. For broadleaf weeds, 2,4-DB butyrac is labeled for all legume seedlings and all legumes, and Pursuit or Thunder is labeled for Lespedeza as well. So those are both herbicides that will kill broad leaves and leave the Lespedeza behind. A couple of the very problematic weeds in a hay field, one of those is a plant called Dodder. It's a bright fluorescent yellow very fine parasitic vine, and there are a very limited number of chemicals that will control it. Pursuit is one of those that does a pretty good job. So it also does a pretty decent job on things like pigweed. Horse nettle is kind of a challenge. You know, if you are going to graze it, sheep, I am told, really, really like daughter, and so with sheep, you won't have a daughter problem. You do want to make sure that you Seed does not have daughter listed on the noxious weeds when you plant it. I have never seen daughter listed with AU grazer. With a little bit of looking into the annual Lespedezas, it shows up quite often. So daughter seems to be the bane of the Lespedeza grower. It's the challenge that's always there, whether that's annual or the, the Ceresia type. But every field I have ever planted has had daughter in it. You know, that's definitely a challenge. One of the things in the wintertime you can, and it's a technique that folks will do over Bermuda grass in the winter. When Bermuda grass is dormant, you can spray Roundup over it. And you can do the same thing there with Ceresia. Another thing, a mean, a regular 2,4-D, which is a broadleaf killer, but Ceresia tolerates it. It'll kind of curl the top leaves a little bit, but it's been a very effective herbicide as well. And some of the things that you learn from looking on YouTube for places like Oklahoma and Kansas where they're trying to eradicate Ceresia, and they will say that there is no rate of 2,4-D that you can use to kill Lespedeza. You will knock it back some, but, and so it is a challenge because a lot of the stuff is not labeled out there that could or would be effective. Have you ever considered burning I have heard of folks from more of a forestry side of things burning a field of Ceresia, trying to get rid of the thatch, and that then they were popping tires after that because it hardened the, the heavy stems that were at the base, you know, it kind of fire hardened them. And then they ended up with a bunch of pop tires for and flat tires for quite a while. So, but it can, you know, it can get rid of thatch. It can do some weed control just from my general knowledge of it. So it could be a useful tool, particularly if there was a, a heavy seed bed there. You know, what it would probably do is get rid of a bunch of thatch. It would also germinate a lot of the seeds that were there. And then you might want to follow that with an herbicide application or whatever came up prior to planting. So sources for seeds is the next question I have. AU Grazer is a protected variety. Sims Brother Seed in Alabama is the only source for those seed. It is available for a number of distributors in the South. A couple that I know of personally are Athens Seed and Southeast Agri Seeds. The question mentioned something about online sources for seeds. I've never dealt with any of the, you know, ordering seeds and having them shipped in from some of the online places. I have seen it before. It's kind of hit or miss year to year. Typically, the seed's been a little bit on the high side of prices when it has been. 
you know, you can check with your local seed dealer. I know Southeast Agri-Seeds has a network of dealers. I think they also will sell direct. Aspen Seed does have a lot of dealers spread throughout Georgia, South Carolina, maybe even into Florida, North Carolina. The challenge sometimes there is dealing with your local seed dealer and getting them to order and to check into a strange variety of seed that they've never heard of, and particularly where it's a fairly high price seed. And so sometimes you have to be very specific, not just asking for Lespedeza, not just Cerise Lespedeza, but asking for AU Grazer Lespedeza and to be able to tell them that, hey, you know, Southeast Agri Seeds or Athens Seed, I think there's probably a couple of others out there, has this, that's who you need to call to find out about getting this stuff in there. So other varieties, and I mentioned that during the talk, AU Grazer has the greatest think of research behind it for the parasite treatment and activity. It also is the only one I would recommend for a pasture type use, a grazing use. Even though uh, AU Grazer was a challenge to find this last year, it typically is available. The others can be something of a challenge to source. What can I plant with it? You would want to plant as a pure stand and then you can add some other stuff later on. Does it have to be in a dry area? So Ceresia does, it is extremely drought tolerant. It does not like to have wet feet. So an area where there's a water seep, sometimes river bottoms, might not be the best area. No lagoons that I know of like to have what they call wet feet or, you know, a real damp area. I've got one area where in wet times, water will kind of seep out of. It's in one of my Ceresia hay fields, and it's one of the thinnest spots that I have. Can it be planted with chicory? Chicory would be a good canyon plant for a grazing situation, a pasture. You would want to get your Lespedeza established and then plant the chicory the following fall. If, if they have a heavy chicory stand already, is there any way they could oversee? I would almost imagine you could because chicory tends to leave some space between it. So I would tend to say that probably would be something that would be worth looking into. So I don't know that it will work, but it wouldn't scare me off from, from trying it. Um, mm -hmm. We had another question in the chat box about using an interseeder. The, the real thing is to get the seed a quarter inch in the ground and to not have competition for it while it's getting established because it is very slow. So it's really to have no competition, so to have everything else killed out, then, you know, some folks have broadcast and gotten see, uh, good stands. People have used no-till drills. The challenge there, particularly if you have plowed and, you know, prepared the seed bed, is to keep it shallow enough. The no-till drill and softer ground will want to go in deeper. Where they shine is planting into ground that hasn't been disturbed and, you know, has a pretty good pack to it. Kind of the, the Cadillac for prepared ground is the double cultipacker, what we think of as a brilliant cedar. But again, it's to get that into the ground, but very shallow into the ground. And it's going to be a real, real challenge to get it to come up and get a noticeable stand if there is other forage already growing there. Planting rate, you know, the, the recommendation is typically for 25 pounds to the acre. What I found of I've planted at 25, I've planted at 40, I planted one at 50. I get very quick canopying and the plants are crowded together and it gives you very, very fine stems. Ceresia lespedeza does have a tougher, woodier type stem, particularly if you let it grow to a larger size. So one of the benefits is that even though that stem is a little bit tougher, you keep it really, really small. Could you address uh, whether or not you think it'd be worthwhile to have any type of irrigation during establishment? I think it would. If it's available, that would let you keep the water to it during a dry time, both during establishment and, you know, even during production, particularly if you were later on the planting side of things. So I see a question for shading. For me, it has grown very well underneath trees and in corners of the hayfield that get shade all during the morning. 
uh, places that Bermuda grass before would not last in, the Cerise has done very well. And I don't really notice much difference in the sand to the areas that get a lot of sunshine. So I think it would work very well in a silver pasture type of situation. If it's used as a grazing crop, will it return from the root if grazed down and it does not bloom or, or reseed? So for grazing, so AU grazer was developed to be tolerant to grazing to come back. So it is a perennial plant. So it doesn't have to reseed every year. That initial year grow in reseeding is to give you a seed bank to thicken the stand for years and years. But in years after that, you don't have to let it go to seed every year. Uh, you don't want to graze it down to the ground continually because that's not going to be good for it. So the way I think about it, I typically get three hay cuttings a year off of it. I'm usually letting it grow up to about 24 inches when I cut, and I'm cutting it at about four or five inches. Probably what I would do if I was grazing, and I would think I would probably get four to five passes of grazing across it during the year, is I would probably start grazing at about 16 and take it down to about seven or eight. So leave a higher residual, that'll give you quicker grow back and, but also give you more passes across it while you've got it growing. So you definitely wanna leave leaves on the plant, it'll grow back a lot quicker. If you take all the leaves off the plant, it has to come back from the crown, from the base of the plant, and that takes a lot longer. But if you leave some leaves on there, it'll come back much, much quicker. Protein levels? Protein levels are typically 15 to 20%, so in the, you know, the upper teens. So lower protein levels than what you would typically think of for alfalfa, which is above 20. I don't know that I've really got any feedback for what it does on production on the dairy side of that, but the dairy customers keep coming back. So I have not heard of any negatives from them adding Ceresia to you know, the, the hay mix that dairy goats are getting. No comments that, oh yeah, well we dropped off this much or, or that sort of thing, so. Um. Yeah, and I, I posted, but there's some research at Fort Valley with dairy goats and we saw some improved fatty acid profile. So some of the good fatty acids were improved in dairy goat milk. And there was a cost of square bales relative to other hay. So it's the highest price hay that, that I make. So everything that I do is legume based. I do alfalfa grass mixes, and then I do Cerisia lespedeza. You know, at the moment, my alfalfa mixes are priced at $12 a bale, Cerisia is at 15. So it can be a very profitable crop to, to produce there. Can you talk about your yield per year? So most of the time, of course, rain plays into that. I'm probably, I typically would say I'm at four to four and a half tons a year on any given field. And so that I'm running about a 70 pound square bale. And that kind of translates into somewhere $400 to $500 a ton. So somewhere in the neighborhood of $2,000, $2,500 an acre. That, that's actually more than I'm getting from the alfalfa, you know, per acre. So I know the general rule is no cutting in the first year, but is there any conditions where you could cut in the first year? Yes, if, if you had really, really good growing conditions, a couple of times I've been very tempted to. What I have seen is that I would have some plants that were almost waist high, you know, those plants that came out of the ground immediately. And so they're actually a little bit bigger than what you would want to put in a hay bale. And then you have the bulk of the field is, you know, in good shape, but then you still have some three and four inch plants. They're the middle of August. So there does seem to be some delayed germination. A lot of times there will be a little bit of hard seed left in that didn't get scarified completely. Um, and so I've always just banked on, you know, I, I kind of figure on doing this for the long haul. And if I can put some another batch of seed in the ground, then that'll give me a lot longer stand life but there's not any research I know of really to back that up. You know, that would just, you'd have to determine the, the benefits of getting that batch of hay off of there the first year 
compared to having the seed bank there for a long time after that. You can graze it the first year though, right? Um, yeah, and, and so now I do graze mine right after the frost, but that's kind of a, you know, the, the field is done for the year at that point. So I graze it at that point. And a lot of times what I'll do after a midsummer butyrac or broadleaf weed treatment, I will mow it up high at say eight, 10, 12 inches to give those small seeds a little bit of, a little bit of sunlight, take the tops off of the weeds that were damaged by the herbicide. And it helps the, the bigger plants to branch out too, because you've left leaves down below and they start to branch off from, from where you cut. So, so with discretion, yes, you could do that. Maybe the downside is that your roots are not as developed. So you'd be a little more prone to having your livestock pull the plants up by the roots. So I'd want to make it a really quick, fast grazing, you know, and not leave them on to hammer off. Reed, can you address, are there any types of soils that are particularly bad for Lespedeza production? I think sandy soil is more of a challenge and it seems that it really is more of a water and dryness issue. So it loves red clay. That happens to be what Cerecia you know, thrives on. And the real challenge in sand is when it gets dry and it always gets dry at some point in the summer, do you have the roots deep enough and developed enough to survive that dry spell? So that would also be where it was mentioned about irrigation, you know, sandy areas would be where irrigation would be particularly applicable. You know, so in sandy areas, I would want to get in earlier, you know, and that very often is the, the coastal plain of Georgia, middle Georgia, certainly Florida. So I'd want to get in definitely on the earlier side of things if I'm planting to get as much of the spring rain and rain during the temperate time of the year. And beyond that, I think there's a couple places. I think Alabama has a black belt that has really high pH, more like seven up to eight. And it sounds like Cerise does not like that. There was a question, I think, right down at the end about the, the pellets. As far as I know, Sims Brothers is producing all of those, and so that would be all AU Grazer that they're using for, um, for the pellets. Those are all coming from them, and some of them, they are providing them to resellers, relabelers, and then they end up coming with, uh, with a different label on them. And I, I don't know of any any other producers other than that. Faithway Feeds was one of the ones that that I had seen uh, one of their labels on it, but that was some stuff that Sims Brothers sold the the pellets to them, and then it was labeled in their bags. Question about uh, hold and unhold. So hold means that the seeds have been scarified; they have a protective coating on them, which lets them last for years before germinating you know, finding opportune conditions. So basically they're, it's, it's kind of like they sand down the outside coating of the, the seed. Now the term is almost a little bit backwards from what it would seem. Hold means that the hull has been taken off, not that there is a hull on the seed. Unhold is the ones that have not been scarified. And so unhold seeds would be the seeds basically as they come from the plant and they will give you typically erratic germination, a lot of delayed germination. Uh, and so that's kind of what we're doing when we let the Cerecia grow the first year, go to seed and drop its seed on the ground. You're scattering a bunch of unhulled seed on the ground that then can come up as it wants to for years and years. Typically, if you're gonna go to the expense of prepping the ground, you wanna get your crop in and a stand up to fight weeds because you know the best weed control is to have a very very good stand of your forage in the field so that there's no room for a weed um, so you want the plants to come up just as quick as they possibly can so that's the reasoning behind the the scarified or hold seeds i've never seen a u grazer sold as anything other than scarified seed you know some different varieties there might be that are 
unhulled ones out there. I would have a fairly strong preference for the scarified seed myself. Some folks have talked about, you know, broadcasting and frost seeding with the unscarified seed. That might be a place for that. I don't have any experience with that. So I'm uh, hesitant to, to jump in too much with it, but that would be one place that that might work. One other question about inoculation, the seed will still germinate and the inocul the rhizobia, the bacteria that it uses is fairly common in Southern soils. So it may be okay, but when you're talking about a $250 bag of seed and a $10 bag of inoculant, it's really, really good insurance to make sure that it does gather all of its nitrogen from the air. So, you know, it may be okay, um, but it doesn't cost very much to add the inoculant. All right, good deal. The last slides are question and answers that Dr. Terrell and I worked on together and provided in the chat box during the webinar. If you want more information, you can contact one of us or you can see the video or website links within this video.